To begin our discussion on rotational motion, which includes things that kind of spin and rotate, we will start with doing some rotational kinematics, which has a lot of similarities and parallels to regular, uh, I guess what we call translational kinematics, which involve displacement, velocity, and acceleration. However, instead of changing from one position to another, Rotational motion talks about a change in orientation. So you have some random looking shape and it might have an axis right there that it spins about. It doesn't have to be circular, of course. Any shape can spin around. At some time later, this thing might spin over and then it might look, well, let me try and reproduce this. Look like that, sort of, right? So the describing of this motion is not talking about changing in position from one point to the next, it's about a change in orientation. And the orientation is best measured as a change in angle. So instead of talking about displacement, we have angular displacement. And within the limits, which we will stick to, that the rotational axis itself doesn't change orientation, it becomes a lot simpler because the only thing you can talk about is either it spins clockwise about this axis or counterclockwise about this axis. And then taking the derivative a couple times, as we've discussed in class, the parallel to regular old kinematics is pretty striking. From velocity, you have angular velocity, omega. From acceleration, you have angular acceleration, alpha. We just kind of switched to using Greek letters and put angular in front of everything. But because of this parallel then, all the kinematics equation that we know and love, we just do this simple translation and we get the ones for angular kinematics, given the constraints of a rotational axis that is fixed in its orientation. So here we have a case where we have a wheel. So this is a circular shape, not that it matters, with a certain radius and rotates with a angular acceleration. So we're given a angular acceleration, but the most important thing that they're actually telling us is that this angular acceleration is constant. So given constant angular acceleration, we can use our kinematics equation. In part A, we're asked to look for the angular velocity after some time. So this is the final angular velocity. And since we're given, what are we given? We're given the initial velocity and we're given time. So with initial velocity, acceleration, and time, we can use this one, which is the same basic form as our VF equals VO plus AT, except we replace them all with their angular forms. That's just subbing in the numbers. The initial is 2.0 radians per second. All these angular stuff is measured in radians because we are doing derivatives. Plus, uh, since they both are positive, they're implying that everything happens in the same direction, so we're speeding up. You know, radians per second square multiplied by the 10 seconds, which is my delta t. And so you get 42 radians per second. Right? Very similar to good old linear or translational kinematics. Part B. They're asking about what angle does it rotate. So that's our angular displacement. We can use then this kinematics equation, right? It's your VOT plus one half AT square. And we have all this information. So it's just a matter of subbing it in. And you can see both of them, the units becomes radians. You have 20 radians plus 200 radians giving a total of 220 radians. So as a rough check, it's 2 pi every rotation. As a rough check, it's 2 pi radians for every rotation. So that's about 6, which is about 5, right? So we're looking at 40, 50-ish rotation in this 10-second time. Not too insane. Then in part C, Talking about the tangential speed and acceleration at a point on the body. Let's draw the wheel now because it is a wheel. And we'll say that it rotates, say, counterclockwise. They didn't tell us, 
as this wheel rotates around this axis, each individual part of the wheel, say this part here, itself is a point like mass that's undergoing circular motion. Right, a different point here would travel in a circle of a different radius, but they're all going in circle. Every single point on the body, because of the rotation, and because the distance from the rotation axis to the point where you're talking about that's fixed, right? They're all going to travel in a circle of different radius. So, given that, we can actually relate this angular stuff to the translational motion as it goes around in the circle of a particular point on the body, right? Because as it goes in the circle, you can then talk about it having a certain velocity or what we call a tangential speed, and you can talk about the angular acceleration as well as the radial acceleration if you so wish, like we've always done with circular motion. To relate these two things, we invoke arc length, right? If this is this distance here, we call it s, is an arc over some angle theta, you can see that s is given by r theta as long as theta is measured in radians. That's just how arc length works. It's, in fact, that's the definition of radians. So if you derive this with respect to time one time, how fast you're covering the circle, that's your tangential speed. And then you derive angular displacement and you get angular velocity. Now for a different point, say this other point, right? The r is smaller, so then the v is also smaller because it's going in a smaller circle. So the result from this formula only applies to a particular point on the body as the whole body rotates. But this is an equation that will allow us to kind of move between the rotational motion and what a point on the body is doing in terms of translation. So in particular, they're talking about at the end of this 10 second interval, so they're talking about the final tangential speed. Since they're talking about a point on the edge here, the radius is the full radius of the wheel, which is 1.0 meters. And previously, we figured out the angular velocity to be 42 radians per second. As you combine these things, the units of radian, right? We talk about radian is defined to be the ratio between the arc length and the radius. That's the definition of it. So in terms of unit, you have length divided by length, meter divided by meter. So Radian is kind of like an invisible unit. It's a unitless thing. So if we don't want it to be there, we don't need it to be there. So we do end up with meters per second. That'll be 42 meters per second. And then they also want this tangential acceleration, right? We talk about anything going in a circle will have a radial component to the acceleration, which is V squared over R plus some tangential acceleration. In most cases, when we're dealing with rotation, the object is kind of held fixed radially. So we're usually not that interested in the centripetal part, but rather we're talking about the tangential acceleration. The tangential acceleration, from what we just talked about with the tangential speed, we derive that one more time. We see that it relates to R alpha. Again, the R here is 1.0 meters. Alpha is four gradients per second square, and we get four meters per second square, which is the tangential acceleration, which tells us how quickly the tangential speed is changing. So hopefully this gives you a nice introduction to rotational kinematics and see how it relates very closely to all the kinematics we know. And then for a particular point in the body, you have these V equals R omega, A equals R alpha to relate the linear motion of a particular point with all these angular stuff.